up, you beautiful bastards? Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. I am coming to you live from your mother's basement because I'm still testing positive for COVID, though the good news is I'm asymptomatic. But if anyone asks me to be responsible, <coughs> I'm so sorry. But with that said, welcome back. Hit that like button because I'm a hero for shooting through COVID. And let's just jump into the first story, which is crazy. <laughs> so that was an airport in Israel over the weekend. And if you're wondering like, what are they running from? Was it Hamas, Hezbollah, ISIS? No, uh, dumb Americans. Turns out you have this family from the States, they're touring Israel. They travel through the Golan Heights. One of their kids finds a souvenir. And by souvenir, I mean an unexploded bombshell. And they apparently decide, yeah, this is a thing we can put in our luggage. So they pack, they go to catch their flight, they check in and security's like, is that is that a fucking bomb? With them immediately calling for an evacuation, people are running, screaming, ducking for cover. One guy even got hospitalized because he injured himself trying to go over a baggage carousel. With luckily everything ultimately going back to normal, they, they clear the bomb, there's no threat now. The incident is reportedly being investigated. The family uh, reportedly was still able to board the plane, thus continuing a very long tradition of America being able to do very, very dumb things and then continue as if nothing had happened. As of right now, it is unclear if the family was able to keep their souvenir, which I imagine would pair well with the five brain cells they collectively have. But yeah, I guess the main point of this story is don't be stupid, stupid. Every time you think it just couldn't get dumb or the world's like, <laughs> bitch, you thought. Also, I wanna make clear when I say dumb Americans, I'm not saying all Americans are dumb. I just think that all Americans have at least one family or person they know that would have done this. Right, it's kind of like what George Carlin used to say, like think of how stupid the average person is. And then just remember that half of everybody is dumber. Then in what was already expected to be a massive event now made bigger thanks to drama. Let's talk about Ludwig's poker tournament. Ludwig, if you don't know, massive online creator. He holds a $1 million event that just wrapped up featuring tons of big creators like Mr. Beast, XQC, Ninja, Alexandra, Botez, as well as pro poker players like Tom Dwan and Phil Hellmuth. Well, Phil ended the night with some modest gains and not the massive gains we saw from Alexandra Botez and Mr. Beast or the major losses others took on. He ended up being at the center of controversy and backlash. On one of the fronts, you had people just taking aim at his general demeanor, with people like YouTuber Courage slamming him, saying, man, Phil, as a fan of poker, I was excited to watch you help grow the game to a new audience. Instead, I watched a grown man baby blame everyone but himself for getting rolled by streamers who were having fun. Alex smoked you in poker and she'd smoke you in chess. So you had some people shooting back saying that's just Phil's brand. Though Courage wasn't the only one annoyed by that, as well as another incident that involved Phil's gameplay, with one clip in particular gaining a ton of traction. In it, you see a creator by the name of Slime thinking that Phil had folded, but in fact, he had just showed his cards. I just have no idea what to do here. <laughs> show the table. And Helmuth just folded the best hands. Yeah, just you down a show? I have ace nine, yeah. Oh my god, what did you do? He folded. Excellent. <laughs> I didn't, oh, oh wait, no. I thought you folded. No. Did you not fold? No, I didn't no, fold, I'm thinking. They keep chatting, Slime saying he thought Phil folded, others in the back saying he decided to just show his cards. It gets weird, messy, confusing. You got Phil then saying that he wants to make a deal, saying he should just put 5K in, calls it a good deal. With the announcer then trying to explain what happened before the cards were revealed. So Phil did not fold. He did show his cards, which is totally fine in the cash game. Slime thought he folded. And uh, a little bit of business going there. Oh my no way. How lucky am I? Where do I? Oh my god. Nice fold. With the whole thing then blowing up, going viral online, everyone chiming in, including some pro poker players. With Daniel Negreanu saying he wouldn't call what went down a really good deal. Others saying that it definitely looked like Phil folded, even accusing him of cheating. Which cheating in poker has been a big topic of conversation in general, but especially over, I would say, the last week or so. Right, with people here arguing that he pushed his hand over the line, so that was interpreted as him folding. With people saying that Phil should have to give the pot back, and Courage adding, this was embarrassing to watch. Literally all signs that he folded the hand, then tries to play the high road like he helped out Slime. Some arguing that this was a form of angle shooting, which is a tactic when one player intentionally banks on another player's misinterpreting their moves. But at the same time, you had people defending Phil, saying that if you watch the clip closely, Phil isn't even the person who initially decides to show cards. Arguing that he simply doesn't know what to do, he moves his cards forward, hoping for someone to lurk, and then someone says to show cards, and Phil motions that he's going to do so. Others arguing that he's pushing the cards towards Tom Dwan, not to fold. And after the event was over, you had Phil defending himself on Twitter, writing controversy over nothing. Tom Dwan asked to see my hand because opponent was all in, then keeps 
Leading said, turn a face up. I did. Opponent then flipped his hand face up. He made a mistake and I got attacked for it. Whatevs, the poker world knows I did nothing wrong. And dadding, I asked the other players how to handle it. They said to collect 5000 or $10,000 from my opponent who was drawing to a 6-3 win. Anyone impugning my integrity is way out of line. And saying that he calls it a good deal because he went with the lower number that people were throwing around. And for his part, Slime seems pretty relaxed about the whole ordeal, with Phil sharing a video where they say... And Slime, they're saying that I did something wrong in that hand. I think it was a friendly game. I think that... I didn't hear what he said. It, look, it looks yeah. like a fold, but it's like whatever. Phil yeah. Helmuth is a national threat and a terrorist. And Slime himself tweeting, One, nonverbal flip over the line looked like a fold to me, but two, Keating told him to flip his hand in his friendly game, I don't care, smoke weed family. And that is the most I've ever talked about poker ever because I am horrible at it. But for those who do play, for those who watch, for those who care, I would love to know your thoughts about this controversy. Whose camp are you in and why? And then let's talk about Amber Heard and Johnny Depp, which by the way, if you're wanting to watch live streams of it, I mean, I, I cannot recommend Emily D. Baker enough. But all of this has been very interesting to see play out in the court of public opinion. Right? Because if you look online, you have everything from people just sharing their firm opinions on the topic, all the way to people posting fan cams using court footage. And right now, if you log on to Twitter, generally speaking, everyone's very pro Johnny Depp. And this is beginning to show in other places as well. With a number of people testifying, but a lot of the focus being on Johnny Depp, having testified already over three days, with Amber Heard set to take the stand this week. But seemingly, even before she gets into that hot seat, a lot of people have made up their minds on this case. With, for example, a change.org petition demanding that she be removed from Aquaman 2, now reaching over 3 million signatures as of this morning. With the petition claiming, as Amber Heard is a known and proven domestic abuser, Warner Brothers and DC Entertainment should and must remove Heard from their Aquaman 2 film project. They must not ignore the suffering of Heard's victims and must not glamorize a domestic abuser. Men are victims of domestic abuse just like women. This must be recognized. And this pressure has existed for a while, which is why when unverified reports that she's only in 10 minutes of the film came out recently, that wasn't too surprising. But again, we don't know how true that is. And there are other similar petitions out there, including one demanding she be removed as a L'Oreal spokesperson that's getting over 90,000 signatures. And Heard is seemingly not happy. I mean, we just saw the news that Heard has now fired her PR team, which is just wild timing. I mean, this is happening mid-trial. She's testifying this week, with Heard having reportedly already hired a new firm, so it'll be interesting to see if that makes any difference, right? Does her testimony or her new PR team change any of the current narrative? But of course, all of that, just the court of public opinion, there is actually a jury in a real court right now. Though, I do think there is a reasonable argument to be made that both courts matter. The real court and the court of public opinion. Right? There's a defamation case about tens of millions of dollars at play, but also this is going to impact people's careers even more than it already has in the lead up to this trial. But with all that said, I do want to pass the question off to you. Based off of what you've seen so far, what are your thoughts? But from that, I want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Squarespace. You know, I've been partnering with Squarespace for years now, and if you're just getting your business off the ground, or creating a place to share homemade goods, your new favorite hobby, current obsession, or even a personal blog to get all those thoughts out of your head, no matter what you're doing, Squarespace Squarespace is there to help. And it's so easy. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And creating a beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform has never been so simple. It's extremely intuitive and easy to use. And with their mobile optimized websites, your content automatically adjusts. Your content looks great on any device. Plus, with Squarespace, you get access to all their marketing tools and analytics and their award-winning customer care team via email or live chat 24-7. So if you want to check it out, see why so many others love it, see if it's right for you, start your free trial today over squarespace.com slash Phil. And when you realize you love it, enter in offer code Phil to get 10 percent off your first purchase. And then, you know how last week we were talking about the sexual harassment scandal that was plaguing the UK's Conservative Party, with one lawmaker reportedly even watching porn on the Parliament floor? Well, that story has gotten all sorts of interesting. The person in question has been identified as MP Neil Parrish. He's been in office since 2010. One of my favorite things is before he was identified, he was even on TV talking about the person in question. Also, uh, he has revealed that he didn't just do it once, it was twice, and his excuse is amazing, with him saying, quote, the situation was that, funnily enough, it was tractors I was looking at. I did get into another website that had a very similar name and I watched it for a bit, which I shouldn't have done. I'm just left wondering like, what site did this guy actually go to? Also, what was the Google search? Right, you Google tractors, you see a link for Johnny Sins plows for eight hours. You're like, oh, a good hard worker. Let me click this link so I can share a story about a hard working farmer. But even if you thought that excuse was plausible, he makes it worse for himself by saying, but my crime, biggest crime is that on another occasion, I went in a second time, confirming that it was intentional with no tractor is able to bail him out this time. But seemingly trying to prove that he is not a sex pest saying, I was trying
trying to be discreet about it. I didn't want other people to see. And saying I was wrong, I was stupid, I lost sense of mind. But then he gets suspended by his party on Friday and he is now resigned. So yeah, that was a thing. And then let's talk about this massive death penalty news out of Tennessee. So this story starts on April 21st with Oscar Franklin Smith. He was scheduled to be executed that day for the 1989 killings of his estranged wife and her teenage sons. With his lawyers fighting to stop the execution over and over again since the 90s, pushing the case through local criminal courts, appellate courts, the Tennessee Supreme Court, and even the U.S. Supreme Court, with Governor Bill Lee denying clemency just two days before his execution date. This, despite Smith's team saying there is new DNA evidence from the murder weapon that shows that he's innocent. So on his last day, he orders a double bacon cheeseburger, a deep dish apple pie, vanilla ice cream. But just an hour before his execution, Smith's belly full. Governor Lee's like, wait, 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 no. Granting a last minute temporary reprieve, delaying Smith's execution until at least June 8th. With one of his defenders saying Mr. Smith's body visibly sort of slumped with relief, he and his spiritual advisor gave thanks to God. And as far as why Governor Lee did this, it's not fully confirmed yet. All I know is it has something to do with an oversight issue in preparation for the lethal injection. Which notably you have anti-death penalty advocates pointing out that the anesthesia and the three drug cocktail used for execution sometimes fails to work. Leaving the person conscious for several minutes, feeling agonizing, searing pain all through their veins. Right, plus another Another drug paralyzes you, so some expert witnesses say you basically feel like you're drowning, suffocating, and being burned alive, all without being able to move or speak. Which is why you had one of Smith's defenders saying the governor did the right thing by stopping what was sure to be the torture of our client. But this is bigger than Smith because the governor is now pausing all executions for the rest of the year, saying that they need to do a third party review of the process, especially with Smith's case, and saying this will include circumstances that led to testing the lethal injection chemicals for only potency and sterility, but not endotoxins. Clarity of the lethal injection process manual that was last updated in 2018 and adherence to testing policies since the update and staffing considerations for the Tennessee Department of Correction. But yeah, for now, at least temporarily, this is a saving grace for Smith and four other inmates. They'll have more time to live as well as more time to appeal their cases. And at the end of the day, we're, we're looking at a range of ways this could end. One, this just means that Smith gets two double bacon cheeseburgers, or this could have a massive impact on the death penalty system, which would be big, especially at a time where in recent years, we've seen drug manufacturers say, hey, we're not gonna give you drugs for capital punishment, which among other things has caused a shortage for prison systems. Though, understand, it's not like out of the goodness of their heart, they just don't want the bad PR. Which is why many states like Tennessee have passed exemptions for open records laws, shrouding the identity of drug suppliers that they work with. It's also likely why we have states like Mississippi, Oklahoma, Utah, and now South Carolina, allowing the firing squad as a method of capital punishment. But yeah, you know, we ask this question about once a year. What are your thoughts regarding capital punishment? For it, against it, somewhere in the middle, let me know what you're thinking and why. Then, with it somehow being fucking May already, midterm season's officially heating up, with 13 states heading to the polls this month. Tomorrow, we've got races in Indiana and Ohio, with a contest in Ohio being a key one to watch because of a seat being vacated by longtime Republican Senator Rob Portman, with a fight to fill his seat being a very big one. Candidates have spent tens of millions of dollars, held numerous debates and forums, and at one point, two of them even got into a physical confrontation. But the main reason to pay attention to this is this will be a key test for Trump and the influence he has over the party. Right, because while Portman has been generally moderate and at times readily critical of Trump and many other members of his party, the Republican primary campaign to replace him has basically been a fight to see who is the Trumpiest, with literally all but one of the seven candidates embracing Trump's election fraud lies, with Trump ultimately endorsing Hillbilly Elegy author J.D. Vance, which for some was a major surprise because Vance had been very vocally anti-Trump in the past, something that his competitors had spent months running ads to point out, with Trump seeming to say it's not about what he said, but who he is now. And it appears that this massive flip-flop for Vance paid off, with a Fox News poll last week showing that support for Vance had surged double digits since Trump's endorsement, making him the front runner. But still, as places like 538 have noted, other factions of the party haven't given up the fight either, which means the primary will be a direct test of how much clout Trump has when other Republican elites dare to defy him. Meanwhile, you've got people concerned over the ongoing legal battle over Ohio's congressional map and the confusion that it's caused for the state's election calendar. For weeks, it's been widely believed that the state's primaries would be pushed back after the Ohio Supreme Court ordered GOP lawmakers to redraw their map. This because the Republicans' map was insanely gerrymandered, with them likely giving themselves 12 out of the 15 congressional seats in the state, even though they only won around 55% of the vote, which is just insane math, right? So 55% of the popular vote, but likely 80% of the seats. And this, despite the fact that Ohio voters had overwhelmingly passed a constitutional amendment in 2018 that effectively banned partisan gerrymandering. But now the election is still moving forward, even though early voting was down a whopping 40% from last election, and the legislative races will not be on the ballot tomorrow, meaning that there's now gonna have to be a second primary just for those elections. Also looking beyond the races tomorrow, 
tomorrow, they're gonna be key tests later this month. On May 17th, you have two other races for seats vacated by Republican senators in North Carolina and Pennsylvania, where you've got Trump throwing his weight behind Dr. Oz. Yes, that Dr. Oz. Meanwhile, in Georgia, the key Trump test focuses on two statewide races for the positions currently held by Governor Brian Kemp and Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. Those two, of course, infamously on Trump's bad side after refusing to help him overturn the election. Which, by the way, literally just today, a grand jury was seated in the federal case against Trump's potential interference in the state's election. But back to the Georgia primary, it appears that Trump's influence here may be lesser, with new polls showing Kemp leading David Perdue, who openly said that the election was stolen for Donald Trump, 56% to 31%, which if that margin holds, there wouldn't need to be a runoff election. Meanwhile, that same poll found Raffensperger leading Jody Heiss, 31% to 20%, but notably, two other Republican candidates only split 9% of the vote, with 40% saying they were undecided. Also, while we've been focusing on the Republicans here with Georgia and these key battleground states, you have Democrats kind of hoping they've made inroads, particularly in Pennsylvania, something I guess they think is possible because they haven't paid attention to polling for the last year. I mean, hell, just last week, an NPR PBS NewsHour Marist poll found that 47% of voters said they were more likely to vote for the Republican in their district, while only 44% said that for Democrats, which sounds close, except for the fact that it's the first time in eight years that a Marist poll found that the GOP had an advantage for congressional ballot tests. But yeah, long story short, the primary is gonna show how Trumpy and the Republican Party is. But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. Whether it be the last story or anything that stood out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below. But whether you do or not, my name's Philip DeFranco, you've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.